Greetings and salutations, Cleveland, Ohio, and the rest of the world. This is Vince Robinson with another edition of Open Door Live. I got a great show planned for you today. One of my uh, good friends and uh, compatriots in the world of music and the world of entrepreneurism is with me today. His name is Reggie Pittman. He's a Kent State University graduate, as I am, and uh, we were blessed to, to walk the hallowed grounds of KSU a few decades ago. I don't want to say how many, but uh, his name is Reggie Pittman, uh, and uh, he, he's been doing some fantastic things in the world of health. He's into real estate. He's got his hands in a lot of different buckets, and we're going to shed some light on those things. So welcome to Open Door, Reggie. Hey, man, it, Vince, it is so great to see you. Thanks for having me on here. Open door. If you haven't been part of it, you need to be a part of it now. So Vince has a lot of things going on. I know he's in Ohio, but he's known nationally. And I'm just glad to say he's a friend of mine. So if you don't know him, you, you should know him now. He's doing, He's got everything he said I'm doing. He's already a step ahead. So yeah. we all learn together, right? So I'm, I'm, well, I'm taking notes. I'm going to tell you, brother, I've been a little bit trepidatious about the real estate game because, you know, there's so much paperwork involved in that, man. I, you know, it, 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 well, it, paperwork it, is paperwork. So, I mean, if there's no paperwork involved, then you might not be an owner. You just you might just be a, a renter. Somebody's telling you something. So paperwork is a good thing. Right. Yeah. So so it's, so once you have a contract and you can read it, like they say, if it's not written down, it don't exist, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe it's just uh, me being lazy on the paperwork tip. You know, you know how creatives are. We like yes, to sir. create, but we don't That's necessarily right. like to negotiate. <laughs> we just That's like right. Yeah. Paperwork was never a high priority uh, for a lot of creatives. And but it's a necessity. Right. So, yeah. so we do what we have to do in order to do what we want to do. OK. Well, uh, I wanted to bring you on to to deal with a few of the things that you have been dealing with over the years. And one of the things that is most impressive to me about you is how you took control of your health. Uh, you know, you have shared in a previous broadcast uh, the uh, challenges that you had with it and how you overcame it. And a consistent theme on this program is the issue of health. Uh, you have a Facebook group that deals with prostate health. So if you would, just give us that story in a nutshell, what happened, how you recovered, and how you've been able to assist others who are facing or have faced the same challenge. All right, Vince, you want the two-minute version or the two-hour version? We got to go with the two-minute version because we only I have now. I figured that. I mean, because I can give you two hours on it. Uh, my story is... Uh, is uh is my story but it's not a unique story because a lot of people deal with uh what i dealt with and we all go about how we're going to find the solution or our solutions individually so uh, first of all i have a holistic uh, i have a facebook group called holistic prostate health holistic prostate health look look up look it up join it uh, it's a great group we really talk about how to um how to better build your uh, immune system and deal specifically with your prostate. Uh, if you have a prostate or were born with a prostate, I suggest you should, you should join. And if you know somebody with a prostate, you should join. All right, so my story, briefly, I'll give the two minute version is this. In 2009, uh, I'm a pretty healthy guy. You know, I'm not overweight, I'm, I'm, I usually work out. I, I went to my annual physical, my uh, doctor did a, uh, Dre, a digital rectal exam. She said, ah, oh, your prostate feels a little unusual. It's a little hard. And um, go to the urologist. I went to the urologist. They did a biopsy. And the urologist said, you have prostate cancer. Now, my father passed the colon cancer. When they said I had cancer, I thought it was death. I thought I was dying. So this was 2009. I said, well, let me research it. I researched the um, uh the operation for, you know, when they take your prostate out. And I said, um, that don't look like my first option. So uh, I went back to my urologist, I think it was the next day or so, because at this point I had a lot of anxiety and stress. I didn't know what to do. Uh, and he said I should operate like the next day, literally. And I said, well, am I going to die tomorrow? And he didn't say anything. He was more shocked of the question. 
So I said, I think I got a week or two to think about it. Um, so I looked up, I went online, I looked at videos, you know, that's the great thing about technology. It can share a lot of information with you if you only seek it. So I looked it up and I, I, I found out about you know, a lot of things. So I said, I'm going to do, there was a book called uh, Heal Your Prostate in um, 90 Days by Larry Clapp, C-L-A-P-P. So, so I started reading that book. I was like, okay. You know, so I said, 90 days, I'm going to do vegetables, fruit, and nuts. And, um, and I'll see what happens. The 90 days wound up turning to be six months. So I did 180 days of no cooked foods, vegetables, fruit, and nuts. Probably lost about uh, 20 pounds. Now I'm, I'm about 150. I'm buck 50, right? Up. And so I was skinny. I look bad, but I had I had sports injuries. I had a neck uh, injury from baseball. I had two shoulder injuries from basketball. I had a knee injury from I don't even remember what, and I had a back injury from uh, working out. So I had like you know I had pains like most people. And after six months, I had my neck was fine, uh, everything was fine. I went to the doctor. I went to another uh, hospital. I went to another doctor. They said my Cancer is gone, and I went back to eating fried foods and brownies and all the stuff that I grew up on. A month later, I went back to the doctor just to make sure I was still on track, and my prostate cancer was back. It was at that point I had to make a decision. Did I want to live or did I want to die? So I decided that I wanted to eat healthy and live. So since 2009, I've been a vegetarian. I work out every day. I do uh, spiritual exercises, um, and I'm still here, and I and I don't have prostate cancer. So that's my story. It's a little over two minutes, but you know. Well, that that's a powerful story, and it is a story that I share. Perhaps not the two minute version, but I tell a lot of people about how you were successfully able to deal with that situation. And it's funny. I had a conversation with someone yesterday who has a mother that suffered a stroke mm -hmm. and um, they ended up providing hospice services for her. And, uh, you know, I just suggested a few things to her. You know, she showed me the, the formula that they were tube feeding her mother with. And, and I looked at the ingredients and I'm like, you know, this is really a lot of garbage. You know, so I suggested to her that she look for a non soy based protein formula and she started feeding her mother raw fruits and vegetables and this protein powder. And <laughs> lo and behold, high blood pressure medication, they took her off of it. The diabetes medication, they took her off of it. You know, there were like three or four different medications that they took her off of. And because she was recovering so beautifully, they decided to discontinue the hospice services because not only was she stabilized and not in a state of decline, but she's in a state of regeneration. Mm -hmm. You know, so your story and her story just goes to prove that foods have a healing property if you take the right ones in. So you made this drastic change in your diet cancer disappears, you decide, okay, well, I'm going to go back to what wasn't working. And then it comes back. And then you make the continuous adjustment to say, okay, well, I'm going to turn my back to what I used to do, embrace sure. this new paradigm. And now your discipline and your hard work is paying off. Uh, you're sharing this information with others. Can you talk about the impact that uh, having this platform has had on the lives of others? Well, after I started doing it, and I want to mention, uh, Vince, that you also are a, a trailblazer as far as health, right? So, so we're in this, we're in this together, right? So we're educating people together. So it's not just my story, but it's our story. Uh, so, so this platform, which I was not, uh, I didn't sign up for, right? I didn't sign up to be this holistic prostate guy. Uh, I signed up to be a musician. Right. So I got a I got an instrument here that I play every now and then. Um, so. 
Uh, so this was thrown upon me based on my lifestyle, right? So I wasn't eating healthy, um, you know, was a little more stressful than I thought. Uh, so I had to change a lot of things. So the platform of being a, a holistic prostate health practitioner means that about uh, every week I get two or three calls from people I do not know. And they're asking me, what did I do? So I share my story. What I find interesting, Vince, is that people listen, but a lot of people are not willing to take responsibility for their own life, right? So if your doctor tells you, as you said, they were feeding her garbage, right? So if your doctor tells you, um, I want to cut your prostate out, you're going to be healthier, and then you're going to take this medication, that's this chemical, that's going to be better for you. Most people would do it. What I would suggest to most people is whether you're reading, whether you have a first grade education or a PhD, the internet will, is your source of information, right? You can, you can turn it on and listen to, listen to it. You know? so, if you're, so if you're illiterate, that's not an excuse, right? If you're a PhD and you're great at, uh, at what you do and, and you're a literary expert, uh, but you don't do health, then then all you need to do is add to your diet, and when I say diet, literary diet, uh, information about health. So what it's, what it's done for me is it, it um, promoted uh, and, and put me in the spotlight as far as being a, a prostate holistic guy. So I'm, I'm always sharing my story, helped a lot of people. Uh, some people listen, some people don't. But the one thing about it is I share the information. Okay. Sharing information is key. And as you've indicated, we are living in uh, a world of massive amounts of information. So there's no excuse for you not to access information that could be beneficial to you. We're going to continue with our conversation as we proceed with another edition of Open Door right here on 95.9 FM WOVU. I'm Vince Robinson. My guest is Reggie Pittman. He is a world class musician and we're going to talk about music when we'll come back. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Open Door. I'm Vince Robinson. My guest is Reggie Pittman, world-class musician. He just lifted it up there a few moments ago, that beautiful, it's a trumpet, right? That's what they call it. Okay, because because some of us were, were introduced to that horn or something that looked like that, a B-flat coronet. I did, a, uh, I did an interview with... Uh, Honeycomb, Michael Honeycomb Hennigan just wow. yesterday. And he was telling me, <laughs> it's kind of funny really, but he was telling me that um, he wanted to play trumpet. He brought the trumpet home and his father told him, you ain't gonna be practicing that here. If you wanna practice, <laughs> you gonna have to go to the park. <laughs> I'm like, man, what a dream, <laughs> you know? It, it kind of reminded me, right? Reminded me of the the movie Mo Better Blues, because mm -hmm. cause Bleak had an issue, and there were folks mm -hmm. that didn't really uh -huh. like what he was playing, and you know it took him a while to get up to speed. But you know, once he did, there was a payoff. You mm -hmm. know, comes with hard work. I mean, you don't start playing a B flat cornet or a trumpet and knowing what you're doing right off the bat unless you That's got. Correct. Louis Armstrong DNA in you and it just comes to you epigenetically. <laughs> yeah, and Louis Armstrong, I'm pretty sure didn't sound be, be really good when he when he first started either. Uh but you know it's funny that you that you mentioned uh uh I haven't heard Honeycomb, I haven't heard that name in a while. Uh I hope he's all right. Um you know when when you when you start playing it's good to be in an environment which has to do with health again. Uh that's that's healthy so it's not much stress. So if you could practice in your house, that would be good, or if in, in an apartment. Uh, what I do with a lot of students now, I don't have it readily available, but well, I have one here, is I give them these practice mutes, right? So if they're in an apartment, and, and just like they said, so if you're, if you're here, and I'm playing here, right? Right, and I do the same thing here, Right, so you could barely hear the one with the mute. So what happens is parents love it because their child could be sitting right next to them. I remember growing up, 
and uh, I asked my mom, I said, and I just started teaching in Cleveland. And I said, Mom, I would come home with a headache every day because these students sounded horrible. I was like, Mom, how did you deal with me practicing and, and doing that? She said, in the beginning, it was rough, but you just kept at it. And, uh, and she's a musician. So, uh, Vince, you're a musician as well. So you know that, you know, nothing... You know, nothing comes easy. Like I said, if you do something for about 20,000 hours in your life of the same thing, you're going to be pretty good at it, right? So so I'll probably put in, I don't know, if I had to put an hour on it, I'll probably put in about 45,000 hours um, on it. So you do anything for 40,000 hours, you, you're going to be pretty decent at it. So, so the payoffs are, are humongous. Uh, the health benefits are excellent as well. So, so yeah, so, so uh, if you, if you, if you're playing a trumpet or something, they, they first gave me a French horn. That sucker was so heavy. I was in the fourth grade, man. I'm a little bitty dude. And I said, I just told the guy, I said, man, I can't carry this. I was like, this is too heavy. So I asked for a trumpet. So he wound up tra- changing it for a trumpet. So, uh, so that's, that's, that's how that happened. That's part of the story. But yeah, it's, it, it's, um, you know, it's once again, no excuse. Right. If you want to play some music, if you want to draw, if you want to uh, get into shape, if you want to do something, do it because it's going to be good for your health. Yeah. Just to bring Honeycomb back into the picture. He also told me that he wanted to play a reed instrument and his father told him, hey, those reeds cost three dollars and fifty cents a piece. (laughs) I ain't paying for those. Oh, and then another side story. I, I interviewed Kamal <laughs> Abdul Alim. Oh, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And he was telling me that uh, his his first choice was a trumpet, but I guess the band ran out and he ended up having to play a tuba instead. What? <laughs> yeah. Never heard that before. Is he is he in Cleveland or is he last I heard he was in Harlem? No, he's in Cleveland. He, he's okay. been here. He's been here for a minute. He's he's okay. still living the musician life. Uh, as a matter of okay. fact, his his program is is on my YouTube channel, so you can okay. check it out. I I may have brought your name up in that or not. I, I yeah, can't. Great recall. guy, wonderful guy, uh, great career. Uh, yeah, g- wonderful brother. Yeah. When I first moved here, I remember meeting him and just being like, "Wow, man, this is a guy I've seen on stage with everybody." James Brown. Right. You know. So I was like, okay. You know. Yeah. Amazing story. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't know how someone like him could be in Cleveland and just be flying under the radar. But, you know, I mean, we, we got folks like Eddie Backus Sr. Mm-hmm. People really don't understand, you know, his his musical pedigree, his level of talent. You know, we are really blessed to have him and prayers go out for him right now because I hear that he's you know, he's going through a little something. I don't know exactly what it is, but send some healing energy to, to Brother Eddie. They're actually going to be doing a tribute to him at the Bob Stop. Uh, this oh, wow. is Yeah. So this is dated by the time this airs. When it does air, the event will have happened. But uh, okay. I'm just sending my prayers out. And um, uh, my good friend, Shirley Cook. Oh, has yeah, been, sure. yeah, Shirley. Shirley's been, you know, checking in on him and you know, doing what she can to make sure that everything is good for him. So, a lot this going is on. A, this is this is an Eddie Backus line. Right. right. So that's the line I got from Eddie Backus. He would always do that. And I was like, I was like, man, he makes that sound so good. And then mm-hmm. I would go home and practice this line. He would do it. He and there's variations on it, right? Uh, but that's that's one that's one of many things that I've learned for Eddie Backus and he was just always he was so to talk to him you know I would talk to him about music and uh he would he had it he he would put things in such a simple way and say it or play it um and it was so it was it was it it, he just made it very easy to understand I remember we went and played in uh Willing uh West Virginia at this um um I forgot the name of the place, but it was a grant. I had a grant, and um, and we had to. Uh, I had some original music, and I had, and you know, Eddie's blind, so he couldn't see the music. I was like, 
Eddie. Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, Louis Armstrong. Too. I said, Eddie. Um, so I was trying to figure out. I mean, I hadn't, for some reason, I hadn't thought about like, okay, he's blind. He's not going to be able to see the music. It's not in Braille. I said, Eddie, I'm not sure what to do. He said, Reg, play it for me. So I went to the piano and played the song. And he had it the first time through. And I was like, oh, okay. It took me about 10 days to learn this song. And he's got it in like two minutes. So I was like, okay. And it wasn't an easy song. Um, so uh, Strutting with Some Barbecue was one of them, Louis Armstrong song. So um, I don't remember if I played it on the piano or the trumpet. But anyway, we played it through once. He had it. And I was like, oh, man, this dude is like, he's a serious dude. And I was like, okay, you know, Eddie Backus. But yeah, I, 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 God bless him. I wish all the best for him, as well as his son, Eddie Backus Jr., who's a great musician. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it probably has something to do with that 20,000 hours. And Eddie oh, was well, if, if there's hours to be put in, Eddie's probably good over 100,000 easy by now. You know, oh, not yeah. Talking, not talking performance hours. I'm talking yeah. practice hours. Right, right. Yeah. The, the practice yeah. hours, because those, those yeah, are I'm important hours. hours. I'm not talking performance hours. Yeah. So we have just a couple moments before we go to break. Uh, what's going on for you musically now? Musically, um, a number of things. I have a band called the Pittman uh, Daniels Quartet. We're playing at the Marriott here in Teaneck, New Jersey. We do that once a month. Um, let's see what else. I'm working with the um, Lionel Hampton Band. We're going out. We tour and go different places. We're doing something in Iowa. Idaho, not Iowa. Uh, Idaho um, at the uh, Lionel Hampton thing. Um, I'll be in Cleveland. Not, I, I'm not sure if this is going to be um, aired before this, but I'll be playing in Cleveland uh, in February of 2022. Um, so that's coming up. And uh, just a number of things, you know, life of a musician. Just, you know, check my book, see where I'm supposed to go today and show up you know i usually know uh, where to go what to wear and how much i'm getting paid those are the yeah. three things i always find out you know yeah uh, before the last before one I, being before the I most, show up the last uh, one being the most important thing right uh I don't <laughs> i'm know just if kidding any of them, <laughs> i'm just kidding i don't know if any of them are, uh, have priority over the other but you definitely need to be dressed right you need to be on time you need to know the music and you definitely need to know how much you're getting paid don't ask once you get there you know, because the answer might surprise you, you know. You know, you know what, Reggie, that sounds like some sage wisdom from Sekou Bunch. <laughs> Sekou, would say, Sekou would definitely put those in a different order. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But he would tell you, he would tell you, make sure that you're dressed properly. Yeah. Make sure that you know your music. And he yeah. would tell you to be professional in everything that you do. He, he says that all the time. And it's a great and, and uh, consistent message. So we're going to talk a bit more about music when we return. And we're also going to talk about your real estate ventures. I know you're doing quite well with that. And perhaps you can share some knowledge that will encourage others to stop renting, buy your property, buy some more property and get paid. We're going to talk about when we come back. We're okay, gonna sounds good. All right. You're listening to Open Door right here on 95.9 FM WOVU, a Burton Bell Car Community Radio Station. We'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back to Open Door. I'm Vince Robinson, and I am pleased to be joined by Mr. Reggie Pittman, Cleveland native, now living in Teaneck, New Jersey, living a musician's life. He'll be here sometime in February, probably somewhere around the All Star game. Yeah, he's uh -huh. doing all that weekend, yes. Okay, February. you coming to perform? Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm coming to go to the game. I'm, I'm oh, going to okay. the game, and, and since we're at the game, then I'm going to be doing a performance while I'm in town. Okay, well, good, and we'll look out for that, and who knows, if, if the conditions are right, I might even show up. Oh, man, I, I, we're not playing if you're not there, man. That, that's, <laughs> well. it, that's part of the contract. This is... Uh, all the musicians are there, plus Vince Robinson. That's like, part of the like I said, if it's not in writing, it don't exist, man. You know, he said, open door. He said, he said if the, the doors don't open, if Vince is not there, right? And it's okay. called open door, right? Right. Right. The doors don't open if you're not there, man. Come on. We're going to ask them to open the door for our brother. 
Oh, no, they, no, no, we, we, we telling them. No, no, ask is, ask is kind. Uh, we're, we're telling them. No. Okay. It, 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 I'm part of the guy, so we open the door for you. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's all not right. A problem. Okay. So uh, I mentioned it before taking the break, and we alluded to it at the top of this broadcast. You have been involved in real estate in addition to being a musician and educator. Uh, what drew you to real estate and what benefit have you derived from your association with it? All right. So, yes, I've been doing real estate for a while. My mother uh, was a piano player and also a realtor, not a realtor, a real estate investor. Uh, so basically, I've taken the mantle from my mom. I'm a musician as well as in the real estate. So in real estate, I would... My mother, as a little kid, I would, she would take me around and like collect rent and or help fix fix stuff. Or, you know, she didn't fix things herself. She had a, a lot of guys that fixed stuff for her. And she, I would just go in the car like, you know, here, you coming with me. I'm like, oh, I don't want to go. And she's like, you coming with me. So I'd be in the car and, you know, they fix it. And it was never long. You know, she just makes sure somebody show up or, you know. Uh, so anyway, since I was, I think I was about eight, maybe. And uh, we would, I would ride with her and just go to different properties in Cleveland and just, you know, not really knowing that I was learning, uh, but I was learning. And um, so once I became old enough, graduated from Kent, hanging out with you, uh, I um, wanted to invest in some real estate. I invested in something in, not in Cleveland, but it was in Ohio. Can't remember the town. It was closer to Akron. And... Um, uh, my wife and I bought this, uh, it was like a timeshare, um, and it didn't do well, right? Lost money on that first deal. Uh, but like they say, if you if you don't fail at some things, then you don't have lessons to learn. So the lesson I learned from that was do more research before you actually buy something, because I didn't do much research on that one. Since then, I probably bought, I don't know, uh, tens of properties, and uh, most do well, uh, some don't. Uh, but the key uh, to to it is to you know buy low and sell high. Um, I, I specialize in residential, uh, single family residential houses. So that's that's my uh, that's my area of expertise. So uh, being that uh, I'm in real estate, I, I, I'm also a realtor. So so I help people buy and sell their own homes. So not only do I do it for myself, but being in real estate, I was meeting a lot of my friends talking to a lot of my friends about real estate and I was, they were doing single family homes, multi uh, family homes, um, commercial properties. So we all decided to get together and form this group called rich real estate, uh, rich is an acronym, a realty investment corporation and housing. Uh, we're based out of New Jersey, although we do business, um, nationally. So what we do is we pool our money together. Uh, into one account, and and we reinvest in communities, inner city communities. Um, it's a lot of work, uh, but the payoffs are great, right? So, you know, it's just like practicing music. You know, it's a lot of work, but the payoffs are great. So with real estate, the thing to do, if you don't want to do what we're doing, is to buy your own home. Just start with where you live. Buy your own home, um, do, make sure that you get a good price, uh, a fair price, right? So the people that are selling it also should be happy. So a win-win situation. And you pay your mortgage every month, and then, you know, it, it, it accrues uh, value, right? So, you know, in, uh, we had properties in Ohio, New Jersey, New York. Um, I was talking, we had a real estate meeting this morning, and and. We were talking about, you know, trying, we, we have a, um, every month or two, we have a webinar. Our uh, next one is uh, March 5th, 2022. Uh, and we teach people what we do, right? So, uh, so I was talking uh, earlier about, uh, uh, I was telling folks about how, uh, you know, how, how easy it is to vet, invest in, and, and the benefits of it. And, and, you know, it's one thing if you tell somebody something, but it's another thing if you experience it yourself. So I started talking about capital gains. So all of us started laughing. They said, once we all experience capital gains, so capital gains 
is when you work, when you make over a certain amount of money, the government wants a part of it, right? Not just part of your uh, taxes, like you know, um, your your income taxes, but this is um, gains above your capital, right? So capital gains. So they want a part of that. Now there's a ways. There's ways to kind of get around it. You can't avoid it, but you can minimize how you pay those taxes. I'm not going to get into the specifics here. Uh, but uh, we all started laughing because once we all dealt with capital gains, we were like, oh, this is what capital gains is. And that's when I started looking for some other friends because a lot of my friends didn't know what capital gains was. And I said, man, I need some friends that know about some money. Uh, so... Uh, so I, I started hanging out with a few other people, but I'm always going to have my musician friends. So to, so real estate, the reason to invest is because there's not any more land being made, right? The earth is the size it is, um, uh, you know, so that, that elliptical is, is always going to be there, but it's never going to get in much bigger. So what happens is if you own a part of it, right? And in the United States, we have that uh, ability to own our own property. Then that property is going to increase in value uh, nine times out of ten, right? Um, and it's best to ha own your own house. Once you own that, you have you have uh, some equity, and you can buy another house uh, without any money down for the second property. That's a whole another topic too. So yeah, so you know, I've I've been doing it, and it allows me to play music when I want to, and if I don't want to. I could just sit home and look at some more properties and find out another one to buy. You know, you said that you are involved primarily in single family homes. Yes. Uh, some suggest when you're getting started to buy a duplex and then you have a tenant that's helping you cover part or or if not part all of the mortgage. Uh, why have you chosen uh, single family versus uh, multiple unit dwellings and commercial property in terms of real estate? I'm going to put this in a simple way from a musical standpoint. Now, this is a trumpet. Most people tell you when you first start that you should buzz the mouthpiece and then play it that way. That's one way of starting. Another teacher might tell you, take the horn and just play long notes. That's another way of starting. Another teacher might tell you, I right, just do uh, what's called pedal tones, right? Um, let me see. That's not a pedal tone. That's not a pedal tone, but this one is. So you just do pedal tones. Now that's three ways of doing the same thing. Single family homes, in my opinion, is the easiest way to start. I didn't want anything complex, right? I knew that in order to get a single family home, all you needed was one family or one person to live in that house, whether it was me, my family, or somebody else. I usually buy the house, live it in, live in it for a little while, and then rent it out. Keep it for about 10 years and then sell it. So that's my that's my strategy. That's what works with me. Multifamilies are great. The only thing with multifamilies for when I was starting out is I didn't have enough money to invest in it because they're a little more uh, now that I don't know more, now that I know more about the game, I understand how I could have done it. Uh, then you have commercial properties, which means that you know basically the people don't live there, but it's some type of company that'll be there. Uh, uh, you know, so so there's a number of ways to do it. What I decided to do was do what was the simplest, like take the one thing and just practice that one thing. And once it worked, I just duplicated the process. I started with single families because that was the easiest thing to do. Okay. Well, if it works, it works. And obviously it is. It's, it's, it's a, you know, uh, you know, people always say, oh, I would buy two family. And I would say, do you own one? No. What do you own? Nothing. Okay. Well, you're just talking. So, you know, do something. Just get in the game. You know, it's like going to, going to the pool. You're talking about, you know how to swim, but you don't get in the water. Some point you got to jump in. All right. Well, we're going to jump back into this conversation when we return after this quick break. You're listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson on 95.9 FM WOVU, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Open Door. Vince Robinson with Reggie Pittman, world-class musician, 
music educator. He is a prostate cancer survivor and he is an entrepreneur. He's got a whole bunch of stuff going on out there in Teaneck, New Jersey, home of the Isley Brothers. Some may not know that. I think I saw on Facebook a few months back that they actually named the street after the Isley yeah. Brothers in Teaneck. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you were there in the midst of all the folks. Mm -hmm. So uh, living a big life there and right next to the Big Apple. I'm, I'm sure you do gigs in New York City right now. I know mm -hmm. things are a little bit crazy up there yeah. at the moment. Um, and we're hopeful that things will change soon as we're seeing things unfolding about the thing that has engulfed the planet that we're not going to talk about right now. But uh, much success to you, brother. Uh, just wanted to shift gears and just talk about um, your time with Lionel Hampton. You know, you you oh, talked oh. you talked about you know the fact that you're touring now or you're involved in you know touring with that group. And as I know it, as I recall, that was really one of the big stepping stones that happened in your life that propelled you into this career as a musician. So could you talk about those early years and, and how things evolved for you? So that, that's interesting. So what happened with Lionel Hampton was I was playing at the State Theater in Cleveland for a play and Lionel Hampton was playing next door. So my whole purpose that day, other than playing the job that I had, which was a good job uh, performing at the, in the theater, um, was to get next door to meet Lionel Hampton and hopefully play something. So anyway, we had two shows that day. It was a Saturday. And I went uh, in this theater. You had a state theater, the Palace Theater, and another, the Hannah's across the street, I believe. But there's the theaters right there on 9th and Euclid. So there's a way to get back there without going outside. So I went back through the back way that you can cut, go, go through. And I get there. The guy's like, security, what are you doing? I said, dude, and I got like a tux on, man. Like, I just want to meet Lionel Hampton. Well, are you in the band? And uh, I said, no, which I should have said yes. But I, I said, no. So he's like, oh, you got to go. So I'm, I'm, so I'm starting to get a little loud so Lionel could hear me. He said, oh, let him in, let him in, because they were practicing. So I came in. So I meet him. I'm excited. Um so the band was practicing, didn't know, I didn't know anybody, you know, because all those guys were from New York. So I said, listen, can I play something for you? So he's looking at me like, who is this guy? So he said, F blues. So he kind of the F blues for the rhythm section. I played something. He liked it. He said, can you go to South America? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, wait a minute, two minutes ago, I couldn't get in. <laughs> no, it sounds like I'm being offered the gig. So um, I was like, I don't know. Like, you know, uh, you know. So anyway, um, you know, I gave his manager my number. Um, at that time, I was doing a summer program with Oliver Ragsdale. Uh, and we had a summer pro youth program where uh, I had Oliver was the uh, executive director. I was a music director. And we had about... I had about three teachers that I, that we hired and about 20 students that we hired. So to go to South America meant I would have had to leave this um, initial program that Oliver brought me in to help, help uh, run. And I knew that if I left the program, you know, it would have been a bit tough because uh, Oliver and I were both running it. And I decided not to go on South America for business. But because I was there to meet uh, Lionel at the uh, theater, uh, I, I, I got to know a few of the guys. Um, and, um, and one of the guys, uh, Al, I uh, can't think of his last name right now, um, uh, Al and Ed Pazant, Al Pazant. Anyway, I got to know Al Pazant, so I called him. I said, Al, I can't go to South America, but I'm, but I'm moving to uh, New York like next month and I like to do the band. And he's like, that's great, man. I'm a teacher. I can't go to this thing to Italy. And if, if, if I go to South America, I'm starting to teach next month. You come in next month, you take my place there. I was like, what? So I moved there next month. And next thing I know, I was sitting in, in Italy. I was in Rome. Now I was like, man, I should have did this years ago. 
So Al and I had a deal where if he was available from teaching, he would go and I was his sub. He was usually teaching, so I was doing all the jobs. It worked out wonderfully for both of us. He would do the local stuff. I would do the tours. Um, so, yeah, so that was the Lionel Hampton story. There's a whole lot of stories I could tell about that, but that's that's how it all started. That's when I moved to New York. So I had a job. I had a job with Lionel Hampton before I even had a place to live. That's amazing. You know, just the idea of this kid from Cleveland. Yeah. You know, first of all, connecting with one of the greatest on that particular instrument. And then you end up in Europe. You know, some of us haven't even seen the west side of Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> My man in Rome. They need to hang out with you a little more often, man. You're a world traveler. They need to go to Open Door and find out what's happening, man. Well, all over the world. Things change, brother. I'm going to catch one of those flights across the pond this year. I'm, I'm yeah, keeping my fingers crossed. Yeah, we got to talk you know. about that. We got to talk about that. I'm talking to uh, some folks about an African trip, so we definitely need to talk about that offline. Yes. Know? So what does this tour look like? Uh, you working with the, the Lionel Hampton band? Uh, well, his tour looks like most tours, you know, um, you, so I'll talk about touring in general. So generally, let's say it's a three week tour, right? And you have in three weeks, if it's 21 days, you might have 14 days, right? So, so you might do six days, in a row. So let's say we fly over to London and play Ronnie Scott's and you do that maybe three days, right? And then you might drive to another European place and that might take 20 hours. So you're on a bus for like 20 hours or some, a long time. Usually you get there, you go to sound check. You don't even go to the hotel. You go to sound check, you practice, you go to a hotel check in and usually three, four hours, they say, okay, you got to get up and, you know, you're going to go straight to the, to the venue. They'll serve you dinner. And then you have, uh, then you play a concert. Lionel Hampton would play, he, he would play two, three hours. The concert usually is supposed to be an hour and a half, two hours. He just kept playing, man. The old school guy, he would just play until they literally like he would take them off the stage or, um, uh, they closed the curtains. And I mean, literally, they would just close the curtains while the band was playing. So so basically, it would be long days. Um, you know, people look at it as glamorous. It's wonderful, but it's hard work traveling. And then you still have to practice and know your parts. You know, you got a band, and Lionel Hampton's band is a big band. But uh, with other bands, it's smaller groups. So it's really like a family on the road. And uh, but you you do a lot of traveling, a lot of bus rides, you know, stopping in some place and eating something that you n normally wouldn't eat. Uh, uh, there's a guy named Charles Stevens that uh, he said, you know, we stopped and I was at the time I was kind of semi vegetarian. And uh, I was like, man, I'm not eating this. He said, Reg, when's the next time you're going to eat? And I looked at him and I said, I don't know. He said, exactly. So, uh, so Charles basically took me under his wing. Uh, God rest his soul. He's no longer with us. But he, uh, he said, man, on the road, you do what the road does. Like you can't, you can't, you can't do what you do at home. Like, you know, when you have an opportunity, you know, eat and you don't know when we stopping again, you better eat. Cause otherwise you're going to be sitting there five hours, trying to, three hours later, you're going to be like, ah, oh, man, I'm hungry. So, so yeah, Charles taught me a lot of stuff, how to pack, right? Like, you know, practice like you know spending your time like so charles charles stevens took me under and just you know mentored me on how to how to be a musician on the road one thing that that i've been curious about and and i've really attended hundreds of concerts uh, in in a lifetime as a photographer um uh, when you're touring you're going from one place to another and essentially you're doing the same show every time you know I mean, improvisation means that you're not going to play it exactly the same way, but you you basically have a, a foundation because that's what you rehearse. But I'm just wondering, at, at, at any point, uh, does a repetition get monotonous? How do you get through doing the same thing over and over and over again? All right. So let me let me let me address that question as far as repetition, as far as when I did Broadway. So I did Broadway in New York City with a show called Five Guys Named Mo. Um, 
I went from Lionel Hampton's band to playing Broadway, you know, so that's kind of, Lionel Hampton is great in, in, in um, the jazz world, but Broadway is another element of music, right? Um, so you're home, uh, you're getting paid better, uh, it's a higher profile job. So uh, with Broadway, you literally play the same thing every night. Um, I did a show called Five Guys Named Mo, it was a, a Louis Jordan uh, show produced uh, Cameron McIntosh and you know so anyway I had a lot of money behind it so what we would do um, and, and on this show as far as repetition and this goes for on the road too so when you're doing road shows but Broadway is even more repetitious is you, you find ways to make it interesting right so you don't really change the music as much but we were on stage, so we would do different choreography. And, you know, every night we were like, okay, at this point, you're going to play this part tonight. All right. And then, like, being a trumpet player, I had to kind of keep the melody because the trumpet kind of plays the melody. Trombone plays more bass parts. And then the saxophone kind of plays more uh, harmonic parts that's in, in the middle. So if you're looking at it as Dixieland, Louis Jordan wasn't Dixieland, but that's just a really simple way of doing it. So we would just change things up just a little bit to keep it interesting right i think the hard part for me uh was not to make a mistake right like to like to play to be attentive every night and not make a mistake that was that was the hardest part for me was just to continually be excellent every every night and that was a discipline in, in itself yeah well, another thing that occurs to me in this moment is the challenge that exists because you might be vegan or vegetarian, you know? So uh, how do you deal with your dietary or your lifestyle uh, uh, concerns or needs as you embark upon a tour like that? I'm more healthy now than when I was 20. So, um, you know, I'm 60 or so. Uh, 60 plus. Uh, so I always keep a thermos somewhere close by. This has my uh, juice in it. So when I'm home, I'm always juicing. Uh, I probably juice about, I probably drink about 50 ounces of, of juice a day, right? So I drink, if if you have a regular 16 ounce, right? That's a, a good, you know, three, four um, glasses a day. So when, when you're on the road, I'll, I'll say what I do, right? Uh, and I'm not doing long tours anymore, right? So I'm, I'm in education, um, in real estate. I'm not doing long tours anymore. So I need to say that. Uh, but when you are on the road for whatever it is, what you, what I do is if we're flying if, and I know that we're going to be in a place for at least a week, I'll go to the local, gro local grocery store and buy a blender right and then that's my blender for there and then if we're in another place for a week then i'll buy that if we're doing one-nighters all i do is i go to the grocery store and i'll buy uh, fruit and vegetables and i'll eat that but even if we're doing just like uh, stops on the restaurants and on the highway i always eat salads you know uh, but i usually carry i usually try to keep some type of thermos with me right so even if i have to buy a thermos at walmart everywhere we go I'll buy one and I'll have a little juicer or something, find a little store. So at first it was a bit of a challenge, but it's like everything else. You adapt, you, you figure out how to make it work. Uh, so, you know, that's what, that's what most of us do that are, uh, have a special uh, nutritional uh, diets. Okay. Just one last thing before we go. Uh, I know that we got to you... leave, man. Open door. You got to go, man. This is yeah, open door, man. man. The they only give us. Shut. Don't shut the door, man. They tell they me don't... what I need to do. Open the. Isn't this W O V U? This W O V U. Yeah. yeah Our voice is united. That open. That always got to be for open, man. Right. You shut at ninety-five point nine on FM. That's it. That's it. So, all right, but if we gotta go, we gotta go, man. You're my man, but, man. I wanna like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just excited to see you, Vince. I'm excited, man. You're I'm glad guy. that we're, we're able to do this and, and see each other. You know, when we did this last time, it was a little low tech. Now we we stepping up our game. Yeah, but you we guys, see, you, we talk. You, we need to know. You look at your background. 
Hey, that's a nice house, man. My background is nice. I got some pianos, you know. Yeah. You know, but your background is nice, man. I wanna, I wanna live over there. You know. Uh, I'll hook you up, man. This is a nice real estate investment, and and it's a real easy one to acquire. We we get fifty five minutes, so I gotta cut it short. But no um, problem. Thank you. I, for having I'm, I'm really anxious to uh, to hear some product from from Reggie. You know, I've been I've been hearing from Sekou Bunch about this pro project. I've heard from Nick Smith about a project. I'm still waiting, and when they when they drop, <laughs> I'm gonna be pushing them hard. But uh, you know, uh, I would like to hear a, a Reggie Pittman project as well. If you find the time in the midst of all that money that you're making to record <laughs> something, I, I'll be I'll be first in line to get it. Reggie, th thank you so we, much. We didn't talk about how much money we make. That's a whole nother topic, right? We're going to we, we gonna have to do another show. That's, <laughs> that's going to be on the next show. We assume. Yeah, that's, that, you don't that, be saying, that, hey, we assuming stuff, man. Come on right. now. That's going to be on the next but, show. I, but like, I have to say life is great. Yes. All right. Yeah. Well, with that, with the great life of Reggie Pittman in connection with yours truly, Thank you for joining us on Open Door. As always, know yourself, love yourself, be yourself, make today your best day. Peace. Thank you.